Oi! Yes! What's going on, everybody? It's Tuesday night, 10 o'clock Central Time. That means it's time for Just the Tip with me, your host, Uncle Wheezy. And we are going to break down all 13 fights on this UFC Columbus card that's coming up this Saturday. And we have got one hell of a card here from top to bottom. And it better be good because we're going to have next week off. There is no UFC next Saturday. So I'm going to have a week off. You guys are going to have a week off from betting on the UFC. And then we're just going to have to regroup and get to it two weeks from this Saturday for the next card. So we got to make hay while the sun shines, you guys. We got some money to make on this card. Like I say, 13 fights to break down from a statistical and tape study perspective. And we're going to get started right now, you guys. What is up with everybody in the chat? We got my guy Chris for the Love MMA, the first one in here saying, Oi, what's up, Chris? Good to see you, man. We got Mark Schillingberg saying, Oi, thought I missed the thought I missed it. Busy night at the home front. Let's get into this shit, Wheezy, in the chat. Let's do it. Let's get into this, Mark. And we got addicted to combat saying, Oi, just finished breaking down this card myself. Time to spark up a cigar and listen to Unk. I appreciate that. Addicted to combat. Always good to see you in here. We got my guy Alan C. in the room saying, Oi, one of the local guys here in Chicago. We got Daz Files saying, Oi, Smooth Jimmy in the house. Yes, sir. We got Lou Betcha saying, Just pop it in to Lou Smash the like. Hope all are well. Hope you're well too, Lou. I know, I know you're working your ass off, but we're going to have MMA Engine up and running for you guys very, very soon. So, Lou Betcha is the one behind the scenes making all the magic happen. And we're going to have that up and running for you guys real soon. So stay tuned for that. We got Paul Brassfield saying, Oi, Uncle Wheezy, salute. Good to see you in here, Paul. And we got DFS by the numbers. My man Brady saying, Oi. And we got Zero Miedo saying, Oi. And we got Cam Camden Gleason saying, Oi. We got everybody going, Oi, Oi, Oi. Do Tiger CKW in the room. Andy MG1 saying, Oi. Thanks for all of your work with these breakdowns. And let's keep cashing these tickets, Uncle Wheezy. Let's do it, man. We got Jacques Tits in the room saying, Congratulations on 26 episodes. Uncle Wheezy is promoted to brown belt in fight stats. Grandmaster Jock Tits signing off. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you for coming and hanging out here on a Tuesday night with us. We got Jeremiah saying, we're here, baby. We got Chris saying, get to hear that max bet of yours tonight, Unc. That's right, man. I do have a max bet teed up that I made about two or three nights ago at this point. But, uh, yeah. There are some bets that I like on this card. I'm already 10.7 units deep, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll be sharing every one of my bets with you guys tonight. And Lou Bet, you saying, I have my own nefarious reasons for being happy. There is no card next week. Let me, oh God. I mean, you know, I love the UFC. I love creating content. I love doing this for you guys. But man, I'm telling you guys something. When you get eight back-to-back -back weeks of UFC, it's hard. It's hard because I, you know, like right when I'm done watching the fights on Saturday night, it's less than 24 hours until I do stat diggers on pub sports radio with Brady. So Brady and I, you know, we don't even get to enjoy if we won some money on Saturday night. We're already researching for what the work that needs to be done tomorrow. So when you got eight straight weeks of UFC, man, I have to keep my head down. My man Brady has to keep his head down, you know, and we've just got to grind it out over and over and over again and just go from Saturday night from the fights right into Sunday on Stat Diggers where we're going to be breaking down anywhere from 11 to 15 fights every week for you guys. So, um, when, when we get a week off, we really look forward to it. And I'm looking forward to this one. Got a lot of other behind the scenes shit that needs to get done. That it's hard to get done when we're creating content. So definitely looking forward to the week off. We got my guy, Chad in the room saying, what's up, uncle Weezy? Let's break it down. Let's do that. Chad, uh, Justin Viega saying when the Dos Equis guy talks about the most interesting man, he mentions Uncle Wheezy. I appreciate that, man, because that is the very, very interesting individual. 
Uh, Josh Locke saying, what's up, Weezy? Good to see you in here, Josh. Raw Torque saying, word up, ladies. We got Chad saying, oi. Hype MMA saying, oi. Uncle Weezy, blessings on this beautiful night in the shy. Yeah, it's raining a little bit out there, but yeah, man, it was gorgeous here yesterday in Chicago. And it's springtime coming up. I can't wait for the warmer weather to start visiting us here in Chicago. We got the Cuban assassin in the room saying, let's go, Weezy. Let's take down one of these tournaments, and I'll buy a Keith Peterson cameo for the channel. Dude, that would be so badass. I would love to get a Keith Peterson cameo on this channel, man. That guy is so cool. DJ saying, oi, what's up? on Chicago here, living in New Orleans. Good to hear a Chicago accent in the house, DJ. Good to have you, brother. I, I'm, I've been in New Orleans quite a few times. I love that city. Such a fun place to go. Got some friends down there, man. Uh, man, you got to love you got to love New Orleans, man. I have some stories to tell you guys at some point. Well, I don't know if I could tell them on YouTube, but I, I went to Mardi Gras a couple times during my college years, and man, oh, man, did we have some fun. Good to see you checking in, DJ. Appreciate it. And then we got the legendary Tits Alternative, says my guy Lou Betya, courtesy of Jacques Tits. We got Chad saying I'm deep as well with several parlays. Yeah, there's a lot of parlayable um, uh, favorites on this card. Uh, Scott Brown saying, what percentage of your bankroll is a unit? 1% is one unit in my bankroll. Uh, Luke Fulton saying, the, the, the lines this card seem to have climbed way faster than normal. I'm really starting to look ahead nowadays. Yeah, you do. You've got to look ahead, Luke, because um, when there are favorites, you know, you do see a lot of people hammering these parlays. They have no problem putting together four and five leg parlays where everybody's minus 300. And when, when those parlays keep getting put together, it just drives up the line on all the favorites. So um, it, it, it's bound to happen. And sometimes the only way to beat it is just to be a couple weeks ahead and know who you like so that when those lines do open, you can get in on the money line and then, you know, wait for any potential props that you might want to bet because those aren't going to come out until the week of. So it's hard. you got to beat some line movement in this game. Chad saying kind of sketch throw. Because hard to parlay this week without women's MMA tied in. Yeah, I mean, I'm done parlaying women's MMA. Uh, Addicted to Combat said, I put out a fraction of your content, and it's a grind. Enjoy your break, dude. It is a grind. It is a grind, man. Um, but that's what we do, dude. You know, I mean, uh, the one thing that you need to be if you are a content creator is consistent. Um, you need to be there every week. You know, you need to be there providing content whenever there is an event. So, um, when they, when they say we're doing it eight weeks in a row, that means I'm working eight weeks in a row. So it is a grind. Yeah, man. Uh, Luke Fulton saying typically one to 5%. Yeah, it depends of, on the uh, gambler, but you know, with me, it's 1%. I feel empty inside. If I can't break down fights each week, I hear that man. Uh, Pascal saying, Oi, holla, holla play. Let's do this. Uncle Weezy. Good to see you in here, Pascal. Much love to you, brother. Weezy for president says Silky B. I'm not nearly corrupt enough. Lou Bet is saying, Josh, maybe I can get Wheezy to do something on the engine channel next week. I have some weird ideas. <laughs> and Papa Placid saying, Oi, what's good, everyone? And Josh Locke saying, That Lou, that's what's up. Yes. And uh, yeah, this week's like contender series lines in terms of getting steamed. Yeah, there's a bunch of lines getting absolutely steamed. Jay saying a lot of finishes recently. I think we may see a lot of decisions on this one. And I was looking at that, you guys. I've got tickers for every single fight that's going to show you the money lines for both fighters. And the fight doesn't go to decision props. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think the first four or five fights are plus money for the fight doesn't go to decision. So, yeah, it looks like just based on the lines that we're going to see a lot more fights going to decision this week. We're going to have to be cognizant of which fighters are more finishers and which ones are more of the minute winners. Because the minute winners are the people that you want to bet when the fights are going to decision. And Scott Brown saying, I use 2 to 3% of bankroll for a unit. Yeah, and it's different for every gambler. You know, it's what you're comfortable with, what your risk is, uh, what your risk exposure, what, you know, what you're comfortable with there. That's going to determine what percentage of your bankroll is a unit. Uh, Josh Locke saying, like me smashing 8 to 10 favorites in a parlay, but I like to mix and match as well. Yes. And uh, Wheezy for the Grand Vizier of Vig. <laughs> What's up, Nandalal? Good, just good to see you. You guys, let me share my screen with you here, show you my, uh, as always, my co-host, the smooth one, smooth Jimmy Apollo with his lock of the week there with that smile, with that cigar, with that beautiful suit, the consummate professional, ladies and gentlemen, 
ready to break down this card from a statistical standpoint. We got 41 of you guys already in here live. Thank you all for hanging out on a Tuesday night. Let's get into the work. Smash that like if you haven't already. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do that. And if you haven't subscribed to the new MMA Engine YouTube channel, get on that as soon as possible. There is going to be a lot more new content coming to the channel as well as the fantastic content that is already there. Check that out. But let's get these stats up on the screen, you guys, and let's get to work right here in the curtain jerker, we have got Luis Saldana versus Bruno Sosa. So we're going to see that Sosa right here is five years younger, but it's Saldana who's four inches taller and has a three-inch reach advantage here. So Saldana's got a nice little size advantage in this fight, and he's also got 10 more professional fights, about 50 more minutes in the cage, and about five more years as a pro. So Luis Saldana is a lot more experienced thus far than Bruno Sosa, and he's even got two more fights at the UFC level and 25 more minutes in the UFC cage. Now, when we look at the finish stats for these guys, we're going to see Bruno Sosa in 10 wins has only finished three of them. I believe that's the worst finish rate on the card. I, you're not going to find a lot of male fighters in the UFC with a finish rate at 30% or below, but Bruno Sosa is one of them. Well, on the other hand here, we've got Luis Saldana, who in 15 wins has finished 14 of them. Um, he has finished, it looks like, um, well, it's it's a lot by knockout. So there would be nine by knockout and then five by submission. So uh, definitely this guy is an equal opportunity finisher. He can sub you, he can knock you out. And he has been finished in three of his seven losses, two by submission and one by knockout. And Bruno Sosa in his two losses has never been finished. Now, we don't have much in the way of stats here, you guys, for these two guys, because we've only got three UFC fights for Saldana and only one for Sosa. Um, and Saldana is doing a really good job with his striking numbers thus far. He's landing over 1.5 more significant strikes per minute than he absorbs. 50% striking accuracy. He's landed a knockdown in three fights, and he's been knocked down once in three fights. Sosa landing 3.07, absorbing five, showing a sub 40% striking defense and a 44% striking accuracy. But, you know, like I said, you guys, um, very small sample size here. We can't put too much faith into the numbers here. Uh, both Saldana and Sosa are 0-4 on their um, on their takedown attempts here, 0 for 9 combined. Neither one of these guys is getting more than 7 and a quarter percent control time for. And Saldana has been controlled for 19% of his UFC career, which is about eight minutes on four takedowns. Unfortunately, since Sosa isn't much of a grappler, we probably won't have to worry about Sosa taking down Saldana and winning minutes there. Um, I didn't, I, I had a hard time taping this fight, you guys. If you haven't watched Bruno Sosa fight yet, it's kind of hard to stay awake. I mean, the guy is a karate style fighter. He kind of darts in and out, very low volume, um, very boring fights. He kind of just skirts around the outside. I almost fell asleep uh, every time I watched one of his fights. So um, it was really kind of hard to watch him. And then Saldana, I mean, I really love what I see Saldana out of Saldana in the first round. But after that, man, this guy's conditioning might be the worst that I've seen in the UFC. I, I, I don't know if I've seen anybody look as bad in his last two fights. Mouth wide open after one round of striking. Um, he had a complete adrenaline dump in his fight against Jordan Griffin. And against in, a, in the lingo fight, Saldana had his hands on his hips in the third round, was standing right in front of Lingo, couldn't even keep his arms up defensively. So the, the, the conditioning of Saldana, unless it's taken a massive step forward, is you can't bet this guy. You, you can't. I mean, uh, I, I just haven't seen conditioning this bad in a very long time, you guys. Um, so this is a fight that's really difficult for me to handicap. Um, but there is one bet that I do like. Bruno Sosa couldn't finish a glass of milk. And Luis Saldana has a 93% finish rate in 15 professional wins. So right now, the finish only prop on Bet Online is minus 140 
for Luis Saldana. So I put 1.4 units on that, seeing as Sosa not much of a finisher. Even though Saldana has been finishing three of seven losses, you know, he's not really getting knocked out by a guy like Sosa who doesn't really throw volume, who's just really a point fighter, who's trying to win by decision. He's more of a minute winner than a than a knockout guy. So um, I think that this is, if, if anybody's going to finish this fight, it's going to be Saldana. Um, but I really do think that this fight goes to decision. Um, and if it does, I think it's going to be very, very close because I think Saldana almost guaranteed wins the first round. But then if his conditioning isn't there, I can't think that he's going to win the second or the third. Um, staying away from this, I think it does go the distance, but I love that finish only prop. You're free rolling if Saldana does start to get his offense off, and he's very dangerous when he starts to do that. So uh, the pick is going to be, I mean, I guess the pick is Saldana. I just don't have a lot of faith in this Sosa, and he's not optically, I don't like what he does in the cage. And, you know, even though Saldana does get tired, he still is is boxing. He's still throwing. So I think that, you know, this will be Saldana. And I think he has a chance to finish Sosa. Um, but, you know, like I say, this is a fight that I'm staying away from. It was hard to watch tape on Sosa. He's about as boring as it gets. But, yeah, I, I guess I'll pick Saldana here. But the bet is 1.4 units on the uh, finish-only prop for Luis Saldana. And we've got uh, the next fight here is a fight that I did a balls deep breakdown on the MMA Engine channel. So if you want a deeper look into this fight, it is Mateus Nicolau versus David Dvorak. The link is in the description of this video. You can check out uh, a much longer form breakdown of this fight. And let me just go real quick here into the comments. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh, my God. Is Tajik Bay in here? What just happened? What just happened? Oh, my God. Go, go, Flamingo with a $50 donation saying, Oi, Uncle Wee's dog, we're going to screw these bookies so hard they ain't going to walk right for a week. I love it. I love that kind of aggressive threat to the bookies that if you get in the way of the people who are watching just the tip with Uncle Wheezy and you get in the way of their bets – that you're not going to be sitting right. You're going to be sitting on one of those hemorrhoid pillows. You're going to get served. And that's what we're looking to do on this show, you guys. We're looking to stack cash tickets like flapjacks. And that's what you guys are doing for me by donating to the show. I can't thank you enough, Go Go Flamingo. That means so much, the generous donation. And I see that we got my guy Tajik Bay in here as well, who it looks like I'm, yep, there he is, the eyes. The eyes of the goat right there for us. And uh, let's see, where where else are we? I'm I'm losing this. So we got Tajik Bay with five bucks there. We got another five bucks from my guy Tajik Bay the goat. We've got my guy uh, Andy MG saying, small token of appreciation, Unc. Oh, God, I'm losing it here. Um, I've got a fresh blade and lather ready to shave these bookies. Let's go. Much love to you, Andy MG. And we got Tajik Bay with his, I think his donate button got stuck again. You guys, if somebody can go help out Tajik Bay, sometimes this happens when he tries to give $4.99 to a content creator and the thing gets stuck and he does it like three or four times. Tajik, it's so good to have you in here, man. I'm, I know you're usually not up this late on a Tuesday night, but thanks so much for hanging out on Just the Tip, man. And oh my God, here we go again. Wow, my guy Tajik just absolutely blowing it up. You guys are the absolute best. Tajik Bay, everybody else, and the MG, Go to Go Flamingo. Thank you so much for the generous contributions to the show. It means so much to me. It helps me out so much. Much love, you guys. All right. So let's go to this uh, Nikolaj Dvorak fight, you guys. Um, we've got um, both of these guys are the same age. We got Nikolaj with a one inch height advantage and Dvorak with a two inch reach advantage. Dvorak has got three more professional fights. They're almost identical in cage time, and they're almost identical in length of pro career. What isn't identical is the fact that we've got Nikolau having six fights at the UFC level out of 20. So 30% of his career has been fought at the UFC level. He's also been in the Ultimate Fighter House and had three exhibition fights there. So he's fought a bigger percentage of his career at uh, at the UFC level and has fought, therefore, the better brand of competition, you guys. But Dvorak has three fights at the UFC level as well. 
about 45 minutes left of cage time, um, 45 more minutes of cage time than Dvorak. Both of these guys are amazing um, finishers uh, for, for this level. Dvorak with an 80% finish rate. You almost never see that, you guys, at the at the um at the flyweight weight class. Usually you see finish rates around 50%. For Dvorak, we've got eight of his wins inside the distance by knockout, eight of his wins inside the distance by submission. Dvorak is excellent on the ground and he's excellent on the feet. And when he's planting his feet, he's throwing hard and looking for knockouts. Nikolau has got almost as many knockouts as he does submissions. Five submissions, four knockouts, and he's been finished in both of his pro losses by knockout. And Dvorak has been knocked out in one of his three pro losses. And my God, my guy Tajik Bey, the, the poor guy has got his donate button stuck. Somebody help him out. Thank you so much, Tajik Bey. It means so much, the contributions to the show, man. It really does, dude. The GOAT of, of MMA betting here in the room with us sharing his uh sharing his love with us and sharing his opinions and his newsletter and all those great tweets that we see on the UFC broadcasts it's an honor to have him in here man um in the striking numbers here you guys we've got Nikolau landing 0.7 more significant strikes per minute than he absorbs we got Dvorak landing about 1.2 more significant strikes than he absorbs. So both of these guys have excellent striking ratios. It's Nikolau who's more accurate and more powerful on the feet. 1.67% uh, knockdowns per total significant strikes landed. That means Nikolau has landed five UFC knockdowns in six fights. Dvorak hasn't landed any knockdowns yet, but Nikolau has actually been uh, knocked down twice in six UFC fights. So that's a 0.81% knockdowns per total significant strikes absorbed. And that means he's absorbing 0.39 knockdowns per 15 minutes. Dvorak has not yet been knocked down in his UFC career. Nikolau has done a good job of winning minutes on the ground, you guys. 21% control time for, 4.12% control time against. That's over a five to one ratio of control time for to control time against. So we can expect uh, Nikolau to use his wrestling to try to win minutes on the ground. So uh, we can also see that Dvorak here has not completed a takedown in the UFC, and he's shown really good takedown defense in his own right, as he's only been taken down three times in three UFC fights, showing almost 79% takedown defense. And what's even more impressive, you guys, is that he's only allowed 4.7% control time out of 32 minutes of cage time, which means that it's only 1.6 minutes of control time that he's yielded to his opponents, despite the fact that they've attempted 14 takedowns and gotten three of them. So as effective as Nikolau has been at winning minutes on the ground, David Dvorak has been very effective in not allowing his opponents in the UFC to win minutes on the ground. And on the feet, it just looks like it's going to be very close. Now, we will see that Nikolau has fought the better brand of competition here. As the total fights uh, is 10, and it's only 3.33 for um, Dvorak. And uh, we've got a 1.14 ratio for Nikolau and a 1.5 ratio for Dvorak. So Dvorak with the better win-loss ratio competition, but much less experience. So Nikolau definitely with a, um, a strength of schedule advantage here. And in the wins, you see that he's beating guys that have got five wins and 4.4 losses, 9.4 total fights. So he's, been, he's beating guys with winning records. And uh, Dvorak has that. He's the guy that he's beating has a record of two wins and 1.33 losses. And the guys that are beating from Nikolau have 13 total fights and a seven and six record. This appears to be a very close fight, you guys. I like the fact that Nikolau might be able to win minutes on the ground here, but even if he doesn't, I think it's going to be a very close fight. So when I see that Nikolau is plus 110 here, that's the side that I would bet, but I feel like this line is almost exactly right where it should be, you guys. Um, this is crazy because I like both of these fighters. They're both great minute winners. They're both really exciting to watch, but... It's kind of weird that Nikolau is more experienced, that he's fought the better brand of competition, that we've seen him use his grappling to win minutes here, and that we've seen him, you know, use his striking uh, 
in great leg kicks for both of these guys. But we've seen Nikolaou really uh, show some power at the UFC level as well, which we haven't seen from Dvorak yet at the UFC level, with the exception of the Ronderos fight. So, you know, I really do think that I'm going to pick Nikolaou to win this fight. I'm going to pick him to win it by decision. And I think that if you look at that decision prop for Nikolaou here, which is sitting right at plus 270, um, I think that that's a pretty good look, you guys. And that's how I would bet this fight. So Nikolaou by decision is the pick. Plus 270 is a juicy line there. I think this is going to be a very close fight. Can't wait to see it because this is uh, whoever wins this fight is probably going to be top five and is going to be maybe a win or two away from a title shot. So this is a very important flyweight fight going forward. I'm going to pick Mateus Nicolau to win a very, very close decision here, you guys. Um, let me get the next banner up. And we have got one here, you guys. Manon Firo going up against Jennifer Maya. So Firo is just one of the hottest prospects that we have in the flyweight division right now. And there are quite a few. Um, we've got Casey O'Neill in the flyweight division. We've got Aaron Blanchfield in the flyweight division. Uh, we just saw Agapova get derailed by Marina Moroz. But Manon Firo is another uh, prospect in this division that's making a lot of waves. She's going to be one year younger than um, Jennifer Maya here. Three inches taller and have a one-inch reach advantage. Um, we got Jennifer Maya coming out of Shoot Box Monstro and Manon Firo out of the Boxing Squad. So we see that Jennifer Maya has almost 20 more professional fights than Manon. She's got about 250 more minutes in the pro cage and has been a pro for almost eight and a half years more. So a serious experience advantage here for Jennifer Maya. Also a UFC level experience uh, advantage here. She's got five more UFC fights and about 85 more minutes in the UFC cage. Um, we've got Jennifer Maya with 47% finish rate uh, as a pro, 26% by submission, 21% by knockout. And we've got Manon Fioro finishing six of her eight pro wins inside the distance by knockout, two of her three UFC wins inside the distance by knockout. Uh, Manon Fioro has never been finished Jennifer Maya has been finished twice in eight professional losses. Um, when we look at the striking stats here, let me just get a sip of water, you guys. Mm. All right. So um, we've got Jennifer Maya at 3.76 significant strikes per minute. She, uh, she absorbs 4.08. She's throwing just a little more volume than her opponents. 37.5% striking accuracy. Hasn't landed a knockdown thus far in the UFC, but she also hasn't been knocked down. Um, but we see Manon putting up these video game numbers, you guys. 7.1 significant strikes landed per minute and 2.55 absorbed. So she's almost outlanding her opponents at a 3 to 1 ratio. She's also throwing twice the volume of her opponents. Throwing a crazy 16.77 significant strike at times per minute. Uh, and her opponents are throwing a, a little bit uh, more than half that at 8.78. She has a 71% striking defense, you guys. Very impressive. Um, so Manon has that karate striking style where she will throw her hands a lot, but she does a very good job of just using a front push kick in order to keep distance to make it difficult for her opponent to close that distance to get inside and hit her. So um, as... As much volume as she throws, as much power as she throws with, it's very terrifying combination. But then when you add in the fact that she's throwing about two strikes for every one that her opponents are throwing, it's just making it very difficult for anybody here to, to find ways to win minutes against Manon because she's showing really good takedown defense too. Um about 100% takedown defense, but on only two attempts. But, you know, she's been controlled less than one-third of 1% 1 of her UFC career thus far. So she's not allowing anybody to win minutes in the grappling against her. She's throwing twice as much volume as her opponents. She's landing almost three times as many significant strike attempts as her opponents do. And then we see, okay, well, what if Jennifer Maya wrestles, people say? Well, Jennifer Maya has attempted six takedowns in eight fights. So 
what if Jennifer Maya wrestles, right? Is she going to be able to get inside? Is she going to start shooting takedowns despite the fact that she's averaging 0.75 takedown attempts per fight, much less it's even less than that, you know, per minute or per 15 minutes, I would say. Yeah, look at this. 0.25 takedowns per 15 minutes. You know, so there's a 25% chance that in a 15-minute fight, Jennifer Maya is going to land a takedown. So if you think she's going to grapple, I don't think she's going to grapple, you guys. And I, I think that we're just going to see her do what she always does, which is stay on the outside, point fight, and try to out-volume and uh, outbox her opponents. Unfortunately, that's not how you win fights against Manon Fiero. Uh, she doesn't give up minutes on the feet. She very rarely gives up minutes on the ground. This is going to be a very difficult matchup here for Maya. Um, when we look at, um, and I, and I want to also talk about the fact that Jennifer Maya has lost twice to Caitlin Chukagian. And if there's a fighter in the 125-pound division that kind of mirrors the way that Caitlin fights, it's Manon. We see a lot more kicks from Manon than we do from Caitlin, but Caitlin's just a master of, of maintaining range and throwing more volume than her opponents and landing more strikes than her opponents and not letting her opponents close distance and take her down. So this is another situation where, you know, if Jennifer Maya can't beat uh, Caitlin Chukagian, I think she's going to have a very difficult time beating Manon Fierro. But, you know, where the line is, you guys, man, and Firo sitting at minus 400 is the best that we can get her. And by the time I'm done talking today, it's probably going to be minus 425 because on other sites, it's minus 480, minus 450, minus 500 over here. So, look, I can tell you that, man, Firo is going to win this fight, but the bookies are already telling you that she's got about an 82 or an 83% implied probability to win this fight. So you don't need your Uncle Wheezy to tell you this. But I'm still picking Man and Fiero. I'm picking her to win this one by decision. Um, and if we can get a, um, a Fiero decision prop at a decent price, Fiero by decision, nah, it's still minus money, minus 120. I can't, it's, I can't recommend giving up 80 to 83 percent implied probability on man and fiero when she's giving up so much experience and when jennifer maya has fought the much better brand of competition thus far um you know I, i'm afraid that this is going to be a stay away for me however i'm very confident that man and fiero wins this fight and if you want to par parlay up that man and fiero money line this week i'm not going to stand in your way i don't think there's anything wrong with doing that but you guys the pick is man and fiero by decision let's see what we got here we've got the next fight oh no i already missed that no i already did that one so the next one is going to be aliyah shkab kisraya versus dennis tia lulin and let's see here what's guy um and let's see let me just get all the comments here um i'm just trying to catch up on the comments on my screen you guys all right now um, the next fight is going to be Kizraya versus Tia Lulin. So now we still don't have, I, I think on um, ESP or I mean on UFC stats, we don't even have Tia Lulin as the um, opponent here. They still got Abu Supian Magomedov as the opponent, but the opponent is going to be Dennis Tia Lulin, you guys. It's um, this guy. Where is he? He fights out of Extreme Couture. He was in Las Vegas. He's been training there. I guess he's been in the corner for one of Strickland's fights recently. So Dennis Tialulin is going to be making his UFC debut. He's got a 10-5 and five record here. Um, since we don't have any UFC stats on this guy, I'm just going to kind of take you through his record so we can see what we're dealing with here. Um, we've got wins against 0-0, zero 0-0, and zero, zero and zero, a guy named Max Budesi, uh, who doesn't even have a record there, a 2-5 and five guy, a 5-3 and three guy, a 0-0 zero and zero guy, an 0-11 oh guy, a 0-0 zero and zero guy, a 7-9 and nine guy, and Juscelino Ferreira, 11-2 and two in, U in UAE Warriors, a good win. And then we see the losses to Ikram Ali Skarov. Um, Ikram Ali Skarov is an absolute stud, you guys. Uh, Jean-Patrick, a uh, split decision loss, um, a loss to Shamalov in M1, 4-0. 
Um, a loss to uh, Mubak Shoev 4 0, and a loss to Fadakov. So, you know, we see that he's losing to some pretty good competition here, in, in particular, Shamilov, Mubak, Mubarak Shoev, and Ali Skarov in particular is an absolute stud. That guy's only loss is to Hamzat Kamaev. And uh, when you watch his wins, he is a pretty terrifying Dagestani wrestler. So um, we do know that Tia Lulin is long. He's a striker first. But when you watch that Ali Skarov fight, if you can get a hold of it, it happened in Brave CF 41. Ali Skarov absolutely blankets this dude for the entire three rounds. We saw Tia Lulin really get drowned by a wrestling heavy game plan. On the other hand, Kizraev is somebody that we see finishing a ton of fights. You see 50 seconds round one, 58 seconds round one, 28 seconds round one, 251 round one, 39 seconds round one, 335 round one, 50 seconds, 57 seconds round one. So you see him, he's absolutely destroying some of these dudes. And a lot of them are 0 and 0, 0 and 0, 3 and 1, 3 and 2. But you go and you watch the fights against Enumoto, who's a 17-9 and nine guy who's fought everybody. He does to Enumoto what Ali Skarov did to Tia Lulin here, you guys. Um, we definitely see um, Kizraev is not just a first-round knockout artist. He can absolutely employ a wrestling-heavy game plan if he doesn't like how it's going on the feet. He's an excellent wrestler. He's an He's excellent at once he gets his takedowns in maintaining position, getting wrist control. He's got terrifying ground and pound and good submissions. This guy, Kizraev, is, is um, he's something else, you guys. But we do have one thing to worry about here. Wellington Terman canceled bout. Uh, Terman withdrew in uh, February of 2021. Fight against Dawkus canceled due to pro COVID protocols. Uh, fight against Lysio DiSharico, Kizriyev withdrew. Uh, and then this one was against supposed to be against Magomedov, so now it's Tia Lulin taking, um, taking uh, that fight. We don't have any stats for Tia Lulin, obviously. I know that he's 6-1, but I don't have a reach and I don't have a fight camp yet. Kizriyev will be undersized here. He's a small middleweight, um, but he's, he's just terrifying. I mean, he looks like every bit of that Russian... Uh, archetype of, you know, really heavy striker, um, great grappling, aggressive wrestling, and the gas tank to push it for a full, you know, something like five rounds if it needs to happen. So um, Kizraev all day long in this one, you guys. Tia Lulin has had problems with grapplers. Um, in, in his fight, um, one of the ones that you can see on him on the tape index was the one against the guy who had no record, Max Budesi. Max Budesi had a lot of success on the ground against this guy. Now, it was back in 2015, so you, there's only so much you could take for it. But you can also see Ali Skarov to have a ton of success on the ground uh, against him back in 2020. So um, I think Kizraev is either going to knock this guy out in the first round with a heavy uh, body kick or a big shot to the head, or and if he doesn't, I think he's going to take him down, and I think he's either going to drown him in the first round, or he's just going to wrestle fuck him for the full three. But either way, I'm predicting Ali scare, or I'm predicting um, uh, Kizrayev to to absolutely cruise here. Um, all right, next fight is going to be Chris Gutierrez versus Dana Batgarel, and it looks like wow. 24 plus 25 equals 49. Support MMA community. Support Uncle Wheezy. My God. Dude, you absolutely just carried the channel for an entire month, Tajik Bay. I don't have the words to thank you for how incredibly generous you've been today, man. But it means a lot. I've been with you since the beginning. I remember, I remember watching you comment on Locke's videos and, and Clint's videos and Way back in the day, man, it, it means so much that you're here supporting the channel, Taji Bay. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank everybody enough that comes to my channel, watches my videos, big ups that thumbs up button, subscribes to the channel, just watches and contributes. Uh, contributes. It means so much to me. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. 
Um, so here we go. Guterres versus Baccarel. Guterres is two years younger, two inches taller, and it's going to be Baccarel with a three-inch reach advantage. Guterres with a big-time experience advantage, you guys. 23 professional fights to only 12 for Baccarel, so almost twice as much experience here. We've got almost 200 more minutes in the pro cage and about six more months as a pro. So Guterres, in, in an almost 11-year career, has fought 23 times where in Baccarel in an almost 11-year career has only fought 12 times. So Baccarel hasn't been nearly as active over um, his career as Guterres. Guterres twice as active, really. And three more UFC-level fights and about 75 more minutes in the UFC cage for Guterres. So he's two inches taller. He's got a big experience advantage here. Um, Baccarel, the much better finisher. 80% finish rate as a bantamweight in 10 wins. While for Guterres, it's 47%. So that's eight of his 17 wins coming inside the distance. Seven of them by knockout, one of them by submission. In these guys' six combined losses, only one of them has been inside the distance. Um, the striking numbers. Both of these guys have absolutely fantastic striking numbers. Guterres landing 4.63 and only absorbing 2.5. That's a 2.13 significant strike differential there. Um, almost 60% striking accuracy for Guterres, which is excellent. And he's got three knockdowns in seven UFC fights. That's averaging out to 0.48 knockdowns per 15 minutes. He boasts 63% striking defense and has never been knocked down. Now, Baccarel, 6.28 landed and only 2.73 absorbed. So not nearly as accurate, but a lot more powerful as he's landing a knockdown on 2.29% of the significant strikes that he's landing. And that's averaging out to 2.16 knockdown for 15 minutes. So otherworldly power, you guys, for Denad Baccarel here in the uh, bantamweight division. He's never been knocked down. And he also has a striking defense that's north of 61% here at 61.22%. Now, in 11 combined fights, these guys have combined for three takedowns, and Guterres has gotten all three of them. So neither one of these guys, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. Oh, excuse me. Neither one of these guys is using their grappling to win minutes, really. They're, they're preferring to win minutes on the feet. This is going to be a striking battle. I'd be very surprised if either one of these guys tried to get their wrestling game going because they're obviously not comfortable doing it. Even though Gutierrez has attempted eight takedowns and gotten three of them, he's averaged uh, just about seven minutes of control time on those eight takedown attempts. So not much. And he's being controlled for eight or almost 20% of his UFC career here uh, on 75% on takedown defense. Back Garrell, 57% takedown defense, and he's getting out controlled 13.66% to 1.5%. So both of these guys are getting out controlled. Um, both of these guys are giving up some minutes in the grappling exchanges, but I don't expect either one of these guys to be grappling offensively. So really it is these strike numbers that make the most difference here. And um, when we look at the strength of schedule, I would say Gutierrez has fought uh, the better brand of competition here with the better ratio and just about as experienced. And I would say that the wins are just a little bit better for uh, Gutierrez here, but they really aren't impressive. Either one of these guys is beating guys that have a win-loss record over 500 here. As the average record of the guy that Gutierrez beats is 2 and 2.2. And the average record of the guy that Batgarel beats is 2.33 and 3. So they're both beating guys with losing records who have less than six UFC fights. And um, Batgarel has lost one fight. It was to uh, Haley Alatang, who's 2-1 and one in the UFC. And then Gutierrez has lost a couple. Um, but, you know, I would say that the slight strength of schedule advantage goes to Gutierrez. Got a big experience advantage here and a little bit of a grappling advantage, I would say. But it's probably not going to come into play. On the feet, you know, I really think that uh, the fact that Gutierrez has never been knocked down and he shows 63% striking defense makes me feel like this fight's going to be going the distance, even though both of these guys are tremendously powerful and get a lot of power, whether it's Gutierrez's leg kicks or whether it's that big right hand for Denad Baccarel. But Baccarel really does have power in both hands. Um, 
the Natividad fight, he was getting charged. And uh, he's a righty, but he was walking backwards. And as he walked backwards, he landed. As his right foot went back, he landed the lead left hook, man, and just absolutely separated uh, Natividad from his consciousness there. So power in both hands for Baccarel. Is he going to land that big shot? Um, I don't even think he needs to in order to win this fight. I think he can outvolume Gutierrez here. Um, I'm going to pick Baccarel to win this fight, you guys. Um, he is a slight favorite here, but I don't think it's going to be something that I'm going to be touching because I think that this is going to be very close. Um, Gutierrez is very dangerous because of the leg kicks and because Baccarel is so heavy on that lead leg as a boxer, you know, we could see those those leg kicks really making it difficult here on Dana. I don't have a strong lean one way or the other. The bookies like Dana here at about a 61% implied probability. Um, I'm going to pick Dana to win this fight, but I think I will be staying away from it. And if you're on that Gutierrez side at, at plus 130, I think that's not a bad look. Uh, I think it's a close enough fight to where if you feel like you're confident taking that plus 130, that uh, I think that once once that decision comes in, you're going to be in that game. And when you're when that decision comes, you'd rather be holding the plus money ticket if you think it's going to be a close fight. So, uh, yeah, but the, I'm picking Bad Corral to win this one, you guys, but I'm going to be staying away from it from a betting perspective here. The next fight is a fight that I didn't think I would be interested at all in, but as I started to research it, I said, you know, damn, this is a good fight, you know? Um, we've got Sarah McMahon going up against Carol Hosa. So, you guys, the very first thing that we absolutely have to look at here is that Carol Hosa is 14 years younger than Sarah McMahon. 27 years of age for Carol Hosa, 41 years of age for Sarah McMahon. And what's crazy here is that Sarah McMahon has only been a professional mixed martial artist for nine months longer than Carol Hosa has. Um, they both have the same amount of fights. Uh, it's Hosa who actually has an experience advantage here in the pro cage, having 43 more minutes in the pro cage than Sarah McMahon. Um, but Sarah McMahon, eight more fights at the UFC level and a lot more time in the UFC cage. For some reason, there's something wrong with my um, Sarah McMahon stats here. I'm going to have to reload them at some point because I don't have exactly what her cage time here is, but uh, it's a lot. 12 fights. Um, either way, uh, it's going to be Hosa who actually has a little bit of an experience advantage here. And I'd say that she has the tail of the tape advantage here because she's 14 years younger and has a one inch reach advantage. Um, it's going to be McMahon who's the better finisher at 50% compared to 40% for Hosa. And both of these ladies are getting finished too, as McMahon has been finished in 83% of her six losses and Hosa has been finished in 67% of her three losses. So um, that would be seven of nine losses coming inside the distance here for these two ladies. That makes the fight doesn't go to decision that very interesting, in my opinion. Um, the striking numbers. McMahon lands about as much as she absorbs. She's way more of a wrestler. She doesn't really win fights with her stand-up striking. Um, she does have um, one knockdown in 12 UFC fights, and she's been knocked down twice in 12 UFC fights. Hosa is putting up some fantastic striking numbers here, landing 7.88 per minute and only absorbing 5.17. She throws way more volume than her opponents do, uh, throwing 14.37 per minute, and her opponents are throwing 10.5. Neither one of these ladies is showing great striking defense. 51% for Hosa, about 45% for McMahon. Um, but, you know, with McMahon... It's the grappling numbers, you guys. These grappling numbers are so impressive. 23 takedowns in 12 fights. 61% control time to only 11% control time allowed. That's a 5.5 to 1 control time 4 to control time allowed ratio here for Sarah McMahon. She's an absolute master of winning minutes on the ground. Carol Hose has done an excellent job of that as well. As she's gotten six of her 12 UFC takedowns. Um, she's uh, getting 35% control time and allowing less than 1% control time. So that's like, while well, Sarah McMahon over a huge sample size is out, out controlling her opponents at a five and a half to one ratio, 
Carol Hosa not to be outdone is uh, is outdoing her opponents at like a 35 to 1 ratio. Um, McMahon's fought the better competition, though, by a mile. We see the 1.42 ratio here for McMahon to only one for Hosa and about five more total fights. And when we look at the wins, they're over similar win-loss ratio competition, but over twice as experienced opponents. And the women that are beating Sarah McMahon have an average of 10 UFC fights and have almost a 2-to-1 win-to-loss ratio. But there were some interesting stats when I looked at the advanced stats for this one, you guys. And, and as always, you can download these stats for free in the description of this video. It's under matchup template. But I kind of went through Sarah McMahon. So she's 6-6 six and six in the UFC. In her six wins, Sarah McMahon is 16 of 25 on her takedown attempts. That's 64%. Um, she is um, getting 73.85% control time for and allowing less than one half of 1% control time against. So when Sarah's winning fights, she's basically holding her opponent down three out of four seconds. She's an absolute control time master. Now, when she loses fights, in her six losses, she's only gotten seven takedowns. So just over one takedown per fight, when in her six wins, she's gotten 16. So that's about 2.67 takedowns per fight. So Sarah McMahon does much better when she's getting takedowns and when she's getting control time. So in the fights that she's losing, she has 46.87 control time, 46.87% uh, control time for and 22.84% control time against. So when she's losing fights, she's controlling or out controlling her opponents at a two to one ratio. When she's winning fights, she's controlling her opponents at almost 150 to one ratio. So it makes it kind of an easy fight to break down. Is Sarah McMahon going to get takedowns? Yes or no? If the question, if the answer is yes, you guys, Carol Hose is going to have a miserable time in this fight because once Sarah McMahon gets on top of you, it's very difficult to get out from underneath her. And unless you are very aggressive with your Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, you're going to have a very hard time keeping her off of you. And you're going to have a very hard time keeping even one or two minutes out of 15 in, uh, in this fight on the feet. But Look at Carol Hosa's takedown defense thus far, you guys. It's 91.67%. And she's given up one takedown. I believe it was to Jocelyn Edwards. And it came with one second left in the round. So, you know, I do think that Sarah McMahon is going to get takedowns, you guys. I mean, you when she when she shoots for takedowns, you guys, she's getting them. Now, Hosa is very difficult to take down. Um, so, you know, that's going to be... The rub in this fight, which one of these ladies is going to get their way? Because, look, if this fight takes place on the feet, Carol Hosa is going to box her up. She's going to outvolume her. She's going to throw the heavier shots. She's going to land elbows. She's going to land knees up the middle. And she's got a ton of power. Um, We haven't seen it yet thus far in the UFC. She only has one knockdown. But still, um, it's there, you guys. She can land big shots. And she's come very close to finishing fights as well with volume and power. Um, but McMahon, that 61% control time for is just a number you simply can't ignore. I mean, Curtis Blades doesn't get 61% control time. Um, there are very, I don't even think George St. Pierre got 61% control time over his career. So this fight, for me, plays out a lot closer than what the line is saying. The wrestling is on another level for Sarah McMahon. The top control is on another level for Sarah McMahon. Here's the problem. The only thing that's keeping me from betting her, she's 41 years old and the conditioning isn't quite there. Because she runs such a wrestling heavy game plan, it's difficult for her to push that kind of a pace for a full 15 minutes. But when she has her way, when she gets the first takedown, and then rides out four and a half minutes of control time, she can push that pace. But if you continuously get up, if you make her work for those takedowns, by about the middle of the second round, she's almost going to be completely out of gas. So I think Carol Hosa is going to be able to put up just enough resistance here in order to win this fight. But here's the problem. Sarah McMahon against Juliana Pena 
won about the first 11 and a half in 12 to 12 minutes of that fight. If Juliana Pena didn't get that sweep late in the third round, she wouldn't have wound up on top and she wouldn't have been able to finish uh, Sarah McMahon there. Um, we've seen Sarah McMahon get subbed several times in the UFC, Pena, Renault, Vieira. Um, so that's been the Achilles heel in her game, but I think she's been working on that submission defense. Carol Hosa is going to have her work cut out for her trying to stop these takedowns and trying to get Sarah McMahon off of her. Um, I think Carol Hosa round three at plus 1,000 is a very interesting bet this week. I also think Sarah McMahon could potentially win this fight. I also think fight to end by submission is going to be incredibly live because Sarah McMahon has an awesome submission game from her top control. And then also Carol Hosa is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, obviously she's going to have her own submission game to go here. And, and McMahon is susceptible to it. So I'm going to pick Carol Hosa to win this fight. I will not be laying chalk on her. I will not be parlaying her, but I may lay a little bit of money on her to win in the third round because we do know that Sarah is going to be pushing that wrestling heavy game plan. And if Hosa mounts enough resistance to that game plan, I think in the third round, we're going to really see the fight turn her away. We're going to see that 14 years age advantage that she has kind of take over that conditioning advantage that she has take over here and that she's going to dominate this fight late. Will it be too little too late? That remains to be seen. But the pick is going to be Carol Hosa by decision, you guys. Um, next fight is going to be Neil Magny versus Max Griffin. This is on the undercard, you guys. I mean, what a great fight to be on the undercard. Mateus Nicolau versus David Dvorak on the undercard. Jennifer Maya, who just fought for a belt two fights ago against one of the hottest prospects in the division in Firo, is an undercard fight. Kizrayev, who's a very exciting prospect, undercard. Gutierrez against Batgarel, undercard. This is a great card from start to finish, you guys. Um, and, and what a way to finish off an eight-week stretch here of the UFC. I mean... Finish it off on this one, then we get a week off, and then we get right back to business, you guys. Um, so, Neil Magny is actually going to be the younger man in this fight at uh, 34 compared to 36 for Griffin. He's going to be four inches taller and have a four inch reach advantage. So, a nice little tail of the tape advantage here for Magny. Obviously, there's going to be an experience advantage as well for Magny, as he's got almost 150 more minutes in the pro cage, seven more pro fights, but it's been Max Griffin who's actually been doing this about a year longer. Magny has 13 more fights at the UFC level and about 170 more minutes in the UFC cage. So we got a nice tail of the tape advantage here for Magny. We've got a nice experience advantage here for Magny. Um, it's going to be Griffin, who's the better finisher here at 61% to 40% for Magny. And it's going to be Griffin, who's much more durable here, as he's only been finished once in eight professional losses, as Neil Magny's been finished in six of his eight losses. So, uh, yeah. Definitely a durability advantage here for Griffin and um, a finishing advantage. A more, uh, He's the better finisher. When we look at the striking, Magny has a really nice ratio here, landing 3.67 and absorbing just over two significant strikes per minute. You guys, that's a 25-fight sample size. So really great numbers here. 46% accurate, two knockdowns in 1,174. Or I think that's actually three knockdowns, but... Um, in 1,174 significant strikes landed. And also, Magny doesn't show much power. And he's been knocked down seven times, though, in 660 significant strikes absorbed. So uh, Magny, not as durable as Griffin here, for sure. And it's going to be Griffin who has the power advantage. And he also lands more significant strikes than he absorbs. So when it comes to the striking, you know, obviously, Magny's not a power guy, but he's definitely a volume guy. As you see, he throws 7.9, and he only absorbs, or, or his opponents are only throwing 4.75. Um, so Magny wins with volume on the feet. Um, he also wins with his length. He's really good at managing distance. He uses his front kicks to keep the distance, and he throws straight punches down the pipe. So if, you have, if you're one of those guys who doesn't pressure, you're going to have a very hard time getting the Neil Magny. But Griffin does do a pretty good job of pressuring here, and he better pressure Magny. Otherwise, Magny is just going to box him up from the outside. He's going to use that four-inch reach advantage and that height advantage that he has. 
And then you have to worry about the conditioning of Magny because he weaponizes that. And if he doesn't like how it's going in the striking exchanges, he'll just get you up against the fence and win minutes there. And he's very crafty up against the fence, works to people's backs, can win minutes in clinch. He can win minutes on the ground. Uh, he's a very, very uh, well-rounded, complete mixed martial artist. And Max Griffin's been on a bit of a heater, you guys. He's put together a couple wins in a row at a very, very impressive knockout win over Song Kanan. Looked great in his last performance against Carlos Condit. Uh, took off Ramiz Brahimaj's ear three fights ago. So Griffin is on a heater as well. Um, but, you know, Magny is a minute winner on the feet. He's very defensively responsible, and he uses that range very well. He's just going to have to watch out for that power because we see Griffin with six knockdowns in 12 fights, and we see Magny with seven knockdowns absorbed in 25 fights. So I think Griffin's recipe to win minutes or even win this fight is to is to land a big shot on the feet here you guys because griffin has done a good job of using his wrestling to win minutes and magni has as well uh magni though 121 takedown attempts in 25 fights and he's gotten 52 of them so we see that magni's getting more takedowns for 15 minutes he's getting more control time um but he's also allowing more control time here so Magny's fights are in control time positions about 54% of his UFC career, which spans over 300 minutes. So Griffin has been in control time positions about 33% of the time. So we do see Griffin being fairly efficient in these grappling exchanges. Um, he's gotten 16 takedowns, only absorbed nine. He's out controlling his opponents but his opponents have actually attempted one more takedown than him. So he's shown a little bit there. But Magny has thrown 121 attempts, and his opponents have, have had 87, but he's getting out-controlled 31% to 22%. So Magny hasn't been as efficient winning minutes on the ground and in the clinch here as Griffin has, uh, just in terms of the takedowns for and the takedowns against. But yet... He still does win more minutes on the aggregate. So I would say that Magny getting more takedowns for 15 minutes um, is, is a good thing. But being out-controlled isn't. So I would think Max Griffin could be just as likely to win minutes on the ground here as Magny can. It's just that can he, can he push that pace for long enough in order to win enough minutes to bank enough rounds to win this fight? Um, that's the question here. When we look at the strength of schedule for these two guys, we see a better ratio and more total fights for Magny here. And we see a better ratio in the wins and a, a good amount more total fights here in the ratio. So strength of schedule advantage for Magny. Size advantage for Magny. He's younger than Griffin here. He's more experienced. He's got the better conditioning. Um, so there's a lot of things to like here about Magny. If you're on that Griffin side, maybe you think he can win some minutes with the wrestling. Maybe you think he can land a big shot. But if he doesn't do either of those things, it's going to be very difficult for him to win enough minutes to win this fight. So I'm going to pick Neil Magny to win this one by decision, you guys. The line is kind of wide. Um, Magny right now minus 225 on bet online. Magny by decision is plus 100. That's probably how I would play it. Magny, not much of a finisher. And, and, and Griffin has only been finished in one of his eight losses. So if you're on the Magny side and you're looking for a way to not spend 2.25 units to win one, instead of just spending one unit to win one, I would, I would hit that Magny decision line at plus 100. Um, if he becomes the second guy to finish Griffin, I would be very surprised especially as Magny has a 40% finish rate as a pro. And in the UFC, in his 18 wins, he's finished 34% of them. So that's only six of his 18 wins uh, inside the distance. So, yeah, I don't like his chances to win this fight. If you're on that Magny side, only bet one unit to win one and go with that Magny by decision prop. All right. And believe it or not, we're still not even to the main card. Uh, here we go, you guys, with uh, Mark Diakese is going to be squaring off against Vicheslav 
Borshev, also known as Slava Claus. Borshev sitting at minus 155 right now. Do you say plus 135? Fight doesn't go to decision at minus 190. So Diakese is the younger man here. He's also going to be uh, having a four-inch reach advantage while Borshev will be one inch taller. Um, it's going to be Diakese with the tail of the tape advantage and the experience advantage here. As he's got 12 more pro fights, 120 more minutes in the pro cage, and about five and a half more years as a mixed martial artist. He's got eight more fights at the UFC level and over 100 more minutes in the UFC cage. Um, he's got a 50% finish rate and 14 wins, six by knockout, one by submission. And Vyacheslav has finished five of his six pro wins inside the distance by knockout. Diakese has been subbed in two of his five pro losses, while Borshev has never been finished in his one pro loss. So Diakese is landing 3.06 significant strikes per minute and absorbing 2.8. He's landed two knockdowns in 10 UFC fights. He's landing at a 39% clip and averaging 0.27 knockdowns for 15 minutes. Striking defense, not great at 54.22%. And he's absorbing 0.13 knockdowns per 15 minutes. Uh, Vyacheslav landing 6.16, absorbing 5.08. This is only in two UFC fights, though. 56% striking defense, 65% striking accuracy. And he's landed two knockdowns in 57 significant strikes. So that's a 3.5% uh, knockdowns per total significant strikes landed. So Borshev showing great power thus far in the UFC. Um, Dia Kese, though, with a nice little wrestling game here, is he's attempted 45 takedowns in 10 UFC fights. He's getting them at a better than a one-third clip, and he's out-controlling his opponents 18.5% to 17.4%. Um, he is showing 63% takedown defense, allowing 1.33 takedowns for 15 minutes. Borshev is getting out-controlled at about a 6-to-1 ratio thus far. He's spent 30% of the 9.25 minutes in the cage being controlled, and he's showing 33% takedown defense. So he's getting taken down 6.5 times per 15 minutes on the aggregate, but it's a very small sample size. That number is obviously going to get better as he gets more minutes in the cage. But Borshev does not have good takedown defense, but he does have an excellent get-up game. You watch this guy's regional scene footage and the UFC footage, and every time he gets taken down, he pretty much gets back up. So uh, he's working for submissions. He's getting the feet on the hips. He's creating space. He's shrimping. He's doing all the things that you need to do uh, in order to not be comfortable on the bottom. And because he has a kickboxing base, he's not going to sit there and play jujitsu from his guard. You know, as soon as he gets taken down, he's going to be working to get back to his feet. And that's going to be important against Diakese because Diakese used to train at AT and T ATT, and he's shown some really great wrestling thus far in the UFC, in particular in the Venata and the Duffy fights, which he won by unanimous decision. You see him go to the wrestling in the third rounds of both of those fights and really win about four of the five minutes in, in both of those fights of the third round with his wrestling, with his grappling. He knows when to go to it to win minutes. So um, as much as of, of a fan as I am of Borshev here, when this line came out, Borshev was almost minus 200 and Diakese was sitting at plus 170. So I actually bet three quarters of a unit at, on Diakese at plus 170 because that line makes no sense. He's younger. He's longer. He's more experienced. He has more UFC level experience. He's beaten the better competition. He's fought the better competition. He's won three rounds with guys like Fasayev. Um, he's a better grappler. He's a way better grappler and a way better minute winner on the ground. And I can't even guarantee that if this fight's on the feet that Borshev is going to be any better than Diakese there. As spectacular as Borshev has looked in the regional scene and at the UFC level thus far, go back and watch what Diakese was doing before he got into the UFC. He had two title fights in Cage Warriors where he knocked his guy out in less than one minute in a five-round fight with one singular right hand. He has got explosive KO, KO power just like Borshev does. He's literally better everywhere and 
you can't even make it an argument to say that he's that much worse in the striking. As a matter of fact, you can make arguments to say that he is the better striker in this fight. So as much as I like Borshev, as live as he is on the feet against the guy like Diakese, Diakese plus money is something that I have to uh, say is the is the side here. And I'm going to pick Mark Diakese to win this fight by decision, you guys. Um, that gets us here to the main card. Um We've got a dude with a fire hydrant for a head in Ilir Latifi sitting here at minus 190 against a 44-year-old man with 76 professional fights in Alexi Olenek, you guys. this quite I mean, like, there are some questions out there in the universe that never really seem to get answered, you know? I mean, like, uh, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it make a sound? You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know? And I guess the other question that we're going to find out hopefully on Saturday is, can you choke a man who doesn't have a neck? We're going to have to stay tuned until Saturday to find out, you guys. But here we go. Ilir Latifi against Alexi Olenek. One of the most bizarre stylistic matchups that I can remember in some time that doesn't include a fighter like Ryan Hall or just some guy that's a complete, you know, wild card. So, all right. Latifi is 38. Olenek is 44. It's going to be a four-inch height advantage for Olenek and a seven-inch reach advantage here. Uh, Olenek fighting out of Russia, and it's Sweden for Latifi. Um, we've got 100 professional fights between the two of these guys. Um, we've got about 170 more minutes in the pro cage for Alexi Olenek here. He'll be getting his 400th minute of pro experience in this fight against Alir Latifi. Um, we've got a 25-year career for Alexi Olenek here and almost a 14-year career for Alir Latifi. One more UFC-level fight and about 20 more minutes in the UFC cage for Latifi here. So definitely an experience advantage for Olenek, a tail of the tape advantage here for Olenek, but he's six years older than Latifi. Uh, Latifi, 67% finish rate. Uh, Alexi Olenek has got a 92% finish rate, you guys, and that's in 59 professional wins, 78% by submission. So let's just do the math. 59 times 0.78 and that is 46 career wins by submission for Alexi Olenek. What a number. And if he wins this fight, you guys, that'll be his 60th professional win. My God, win or lose, you got to love Alexi Olenek. What, I mean, what a G. What, an, what, a, what a credit to the sport. What a veteran that we've got fighting here. Um, and these guys have been finishing a decent amount of their losses as Latifi has been finished in four of his eight losses. And we got 69% here for Olenek. So that would be uh, 11 of his 16 losses coming inside the distance. Now, before we get into the numbers here, this is just kind of like a bizarre stylistic matchup, you guys. So Latifi is a wrestler. And he's either a guy, when he wins, he either knocks you out in the first round or subs you in the first round. Or he wins a decision where he's wrestling for three rounds and piling up a ton of control time. Uh, that's really the only ways that he wins. Um, Olenek is obviously a master of getting submissions. I mean, 46 wins by submission in a 76 fight career. So when you see Olenek and how he wins fights, he needs it to go to the ground. And he, it doesn't really matter if he's on top or on the bottom, he's going to be dangerous from wherever. Um, and Latifi is going to either have to knock this guy out early, which is definitely possible. I mean, Alexi Olenek has been knocked down on 1.29% of the significant strikes that he's absorbed, which I believe is five times that he's been knocked down in 15 fights. And he's lost a significant amount of his losses uh, as a pro or by knockout. Um, he's been knocked out 50, 56% of his uh, 16 losses. So he's been knocked out nine times. Um, so Latifi you know, absorbs one more significant strike per minute than he lands. Um, he's getting knockdowns on 1.83% of the total significant strikes that he lands, and he's averaging 0.5 knockdowns for 15 minutes. He's been knocked down three times, and he's absorbing 0.38 knockdowns for 15 minutes. Um, Olenek 
is landing 3.55, absorbing 3.99. He's got a 45% striking defense, which is not good. Uh, and he's getting knocked down at about 1.3% of the significant strikes that he absorbs. So the question is, you guys, is Latifi going to try to take this guy down? Does he want to be, you know, on the ground with Alexi Olenek, a guy who can literally win fights when he's mounted with submission victories? I, that's a that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what Alir Latifi is going to do here. I think he might just try to box with him and, and try to get the knockout because – I just don't think that this guy wants to be on the ground with a, with a grappler of Olenek's, you know, uh, quality. But then there's that question. It's like, Alexi Olenek chokes people out, but can you choke a man that doesn't have a neck? Is that possible? You know, are we going to answer that question? Because we've got a dude with no neck and all in an Easter Island statue for a head here in, in Latifi, right? So it's like, if you're going to choke him out, it's basically you got to break his jaw. Because there's no throat, you know, um, the shoulders just meet right right here at the jaw. So, like, I don't even think the guy has carotid arteries that could be, like, covered up by a human being. It's like you need to have surgery in order to get in there and block this man's carotid artery. So, can you choke a man with no neck? If the answer is no, then Latifi can not only win this fight on the feet with a, by landing a big shot and knocking out uh, Olenek, but he can also grind it out on the ground by winning minutes there um and when you you know i forgot how many knockout wins you know latifi has you know eight ufc wins three of them are by knockout two of them are by submission and he's won three decisions as well um it's a tough fight to call i saw that my guy jack attack had put out a free tip uh to bet uh um latifi at minus 150 earlier in the week but that line is long gone um, right now, Latifi is sitting at minus 195. He's minus 200 in a couple spots, actually. And we got the comeback at plus 170 on Alexi Olenek. Boy, I mean, this is a bizarre fight, you guys. I don't even know what to say because I don't know if Latifi can survive on the ground with Olenek. I don't know if he can win a boxing match with Olenek when he's at a seven-inch reach disadvantage here. And um, we've seen Olenek wins a striking match with, with Fabricio Verdun. So I'm going to – all right, I'm going to pick Alir Latifi to win this fight, but if you put a gun to my head and you said pick a money line, I'd be taking the plus money on the old man here because Latifi's kind of old as well, and I think his best quality is being able to use that wrestling in order to win minutes. Uh, I don't know if he could do that here against Olenek, and I think if he gets reckless and he, and he rushes in with his striking – um, Olenek doesn't really need to get a takedown, you guys. He can take the back. He can pull guard. Um, there's a number of different ways that this fight can go to the ground and Olenek can be dangerous. So I'm going to say that I'm not going to bet Latifi here at minus 195. I would rather bet Olenek at plus 170. But I'm going to pick Olir Latifi to win this fight. I'm just really confused by it, guy. guys. I wish I had a better read for you on this one, but it is truly a frustrating fight to try to break down. Next fight, though, very interesting one, Askarov against France. Um, so both of these guys are, are below 30 years old. It's Askarov who's going to have a two-inch height advantage and Kaikara France who has a two-inch reach advantage. Huge experience advantage here for Kaikara France, an absolute journeyman of the sport, 33 professional fights, 23 and 9 record. He's fought everybody. Um, I watched him fight Danab Batgarel on the Asian re regional scene. It was a great fight. Um, Batgarel got that win, but uh, Kai Kara France's face got boxed up in that one, and, and it was a great back and forth battle. Um, so we've got twice as much experience in the cage here for Kai Kara France. Uh, almost 20 more fights about 140 more minutes in the cage and about, you know, two and a half more years as a pro. Um, he's got four more fights at the UFC level and 30 more minutes in the UFC cage. If we look at how these guys finish fights, we've got a 77% finish rate for Askarov and we've got a 61% finish rate for France. And France has been finishing five of his nine pro losses. Askarov, Askarov has never lost. Um, if we look at the striking stats, we see 3.37 landed for Askarov, 2.65 absorbed. He's never knocked anybody down, and he has been knocked down once. 
57% striking defense, 55.5% striking accuracy. Kai Kara France is landing 5.09 and absorbing 3.79. Not nearly as accurate as Askarov, but much more powerful as he's landing six knockdowns in eight UFC fights. Don't blink is a great nickname because Kai Kara France can end a fight with one shot, just like he did against Bontorin. Um, he is also showing a 65.72% takedown or striking defense here. He throws more opponent, uh, more volume than his opponents, and he's been knocked down three times in eight UFC fights. So you got to give Kai Kara France a striking advantage here simply because of the power. Um, Askarov uses his striking to set up his grappling attacks, and his grappling is where he really makes his money. Excuse me, guys. All right. Sorry about that. So um, you got to give Kai Kara France the, the advantage on the feet here because of that power and the fact that he throws a lot more volume. Um, but it, it's Askarov who's spending a much higher percentage of his fight in control time positions, right? 48% of his fights taking place in control time positions. He's out controlling his opponents at about a two to one ratio here. Getting 2.75 takedowns for 15 minutes and absorbing 1.25 takedowns for 15 minutes. He's been taken down five times, uh, and he's allowed 17.86% control time. Now, for France, he's got three takedowns in eight fights. He's getting 13.5% control time, only allowing 10. So this is really good because he's his opponents have attempted 24 takedowns, and Kai Kara France has only attempted 13. But despite the fact that France's opponents are out takedown attempting France at a 2-to-1 ratio, Kai Kara France is getting more control time than his opponent. So he's been very efficient in the grappling exchanges. And if he wants to win this fight, he's going to have to continue being very efficient in the grappling exchanges. 87.5% takedown defense, you guys. That's going to have to hold up because Askarov is solid on the feet. He's not bad there, but Kai Kara France, if this is a 15-minute striking match, is not going to look plus 250. He's going to look a lot better than that, a lot closer to evens or even maybe a favorite. So we're going to have to really look out here to see if Kai Kara France's takedown defense is going to hold up against Askarov. 28.2% takedown accuracy. That's not great. But when we see 60 minutes of cage time and 30 minutes of uh, or 30% control time, that tells us that he's gotten 18 minutes of control time on those 11 takedowns. So when he does get the takedown, Askarov is a good, is very good at winning minutes down there. He has not finished any of his uh, UFC wins yet, while uh, Kai Kara France has finished two of his UFC wins. So if we go to the strength of schedule here, you guys, um, we're going to see that Askarov has fought and beaten the better brand of competition here. As we see 14 total fights to only 5.38 for France and a much better ratio of 1.95 to 1.53 for France. And then you look at the wins, and uh, Askarov is beating three times more experienced competition with the better win-loss ratio. And you see the names on his resume. Win over Benavidez, win over Pantoja, win over Elliott. A split decision draw with Brandon Moreno, which was just... And it made no sense because none of those rounds could have remotely been considered a 10-8 round. Um, but... Of course, one of the uh, credits to the sport, Sal D'Amato, somehow came up with a 28-28 scorecard. And, I mean, it could be that he scored one of the rounds 10-8, but the more likely explanation is that he's too fucking stupid to add 10, 10, and 9 and come up with 29 instead of 28. But either way, uh, Askarov should really be 4-0 in the UFC here. Um, when we've seen Kai Kara France lose... Roy Val by sub, Moreno by unanimous decision. It's guys that can grapple that have wound up beating him, and Askarov absolutely fits into that role. Um, when Kai Kara France loses, he has been submitted um, three times. So, you know, we could see Askarov get a win by submission here. We've also seen Askarov on skates uh, when he gets hit big, and, that, and that's somebody in Kai Kara France who can absolutely do that. The fight doesn't go to decision for this one. Could be a really sneaky bet. It is 
at plus 155 right now on Bet Online, you guys. I could see a path for Askarov to win this one by submission. I could see a path for Kai Kara France to win this one by knockout if he winds up keeping this thing on the feet. Um, at plus 155, I might throw a half unit on that just for a larf and have a little fun with it because I, I could see violence happening in this fight. But we've got Askarov sitting up here around minus 350. The money is still coming in on him here at minus 350, plus 285 on the comeback for Kai Kara France. Um, the Askarov submission prop sitting north of plus 300 here. The France by KO prop sitting north of plus 700. Um, those are both very interesting props here. Uh, fight doesn't go to decision. France by knockout. Askarov by submission are all some plus money ways to play this fight that I think you can make some money if you if you get on the right side. But I have to pick Askar Askarov in this one. Um, I think he'll be able to survive the striking exchanges on the feet and win enough minutes in the grappling in order to stay safe uh, to potentially get this thing to the ground, get a submission, or win a decision here. But uh, the pick is going to be Askar Askarov, you guys. All right. And now let's see. Oh, boy. We got some violence coming up here, you guys. Brian Barbarena versus Matt Brown. And uh, this is going to be such a great fight. Uh, two all action fighters who between the two of them have really never even been in a boring fight. Can't wait to break this one down for you guys. Brian Barbarena, nine years younger here. Uh, they have the, they are the same height and it's going to be Brown who has a three inch reach advantage. Orthodox versus Southpaw matchup. That means the power uh, weapons of both of these guys are going to be open for business. Straight right. The right uh, kick for Brown, the 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 left for Barbarena, and the big left body kick. Um, we've got Brown with a 17 fight advantage here, and about 50 more minutes in the pro cage, and he's been doing this about four years longer. 15 more UFC level fights, and 100 more minutes in the UFC cage. So a three inch reach advantage, uh, a 17 fight advantage, a 15 UFC level fight advantage. 100 more minutes in the UFC cage. Lots of light there, but remember, Brian Barbarena is nine years younger. Uh, both of these guys are fantastic finishers. 75% finish rate for Brian Barbarena. 91% um, finish rate for Matt Brown. 21 of 23 wins inside the distance for Matt Brown here. And in terms of how these guys get finished, we got a 73% finish rate inside the distance for Matt Brown and a 38% uh, uh, finish rate against Barbarena here in his eight losses. So five of eight losses inside the distance for Barbarena, and 66, 73%. So 13 losses of 18 for Brown inside the distance. So, so that would be 13 and 6 is 19 of 26 losses inside the distance. So both of these guys win, and both of these guys lose inside the distance. The violence prop for this fight is a great bet. Um, when we look at the striking numbers, we see that Brown over a huge sample size lands one more significant strike than he absorbs per minute. Uh, he throws almost one more significant strike attempt per minute than his opponents throw. 55% striking accuracy. He's landed 10 knockdowns in 28 fights, and he's been knocked down, I believe, eight times in 28 fights. Um, we see Barbarena landing 5.44, absorbing 4.77. Not a good striking defense at 45%, but he has not been knocked down much. Uh, three times in 765 uh, significant strikes absorbed and in 13 fights. So it does, it does look like Brown's more powerful, but it also looks like Brown is more chinny here. Um, but it is going to be Brown who's more defensively responsible and has the better significant strike ratio to the to significant strikes absorbed. Now, when we go to the grappling side, this is where it's interesting. 58% uh, takedown defense for Brian Barbarena over a 13-fight sample size, and he's getting control of more than 25% of his UFC career. So he's allowed 40 minutes of control time on those 36 absorbed takedowns. So he is a guy that's pretty easy to take down and hold down. Brown as well as he only has 64% takedown defense, and he's allowed 35% control time over a 28-fight sample size. So, I mean, that's like 90 minutes 
uh, of control time on 42 takedowns absorbed for Brown. So Brown is even easier to control on the ground than Barbarina is. But the problem here is, is that Brown averages 1.49 takedowns for 15 minutes, while for Barbarina, it's less than 0.2. So I think that this fight's going to be very close on the feet. We know how what bad intentions Matt Brown has on the feet here. But I think that Brown being able to win minutes in the grappling here and being the far more willing wrestler um, that as 50-50 as I see this fight being on the feet, I do like Brown's ability to be able to win minutes on the ground. Um, and he's been able to do that. Um, you would expect him to be out-controlled by the amount that he's getting out-controlled by because his opponents have attempted two times as many takedowns as he has. So the fact that he's getting out-controlled by less than a two-to-one ratio shows he's pretty efficient here. Um, Barbarena has, you know, been taken down 36 times and has only gotten two takedowns, but, you know, he's been efficient because he's getting 10% control time and only allowing 26. So I think that's a very close fight. I don't like the fact that Matt Brown is 41 years old here, but it's going to be a war. And, you know, this is a hometown fight for Matt Brown. Um, you know, and every fight that Matt Brown fights from now on could be his last. So I'm looking for this guy to come out, go balls out, try to finish this fight. And if he doesn't, he probably will get finished. I think that this fight's going to finish inside the distance, you guys. Um, when we look at the strength of schedule numbers here, um, we see a better ratio for Brian Barbarena, but more total fights for Matt Brown. Um, and when we look at the wins, they're better, a little bit better for Brown here. As the average win for Brown is 6.31 wins, 4.7 losses. And for Barbarina, it's 4.14 wins and 2.71 losses. All right. And then both of these guys are losing to absolute studs. But for Bar Barbarina, it's even better with a 2.47 win to loss ratio. So I like Brown's ability to be able to land the bigger shots here. And I also like Brown's ability to be able to potentially win minutes. Uh, I'm going to be picking Matt Brown to win this fight inside the distance in the second round by knockout you guys um that brings us to our co-main event which is joanne wood against alexa grasso we got grasso sitting up here at minus 235 wood the comeback plus 200 fight doesn't go to decision at plus 195 so the the bookies are absolutely expecting this one to go the distance uh grasso eight years younger and she's going to have a one inch reach advantage here Joanne Wood, though, with uh, six more professional fights, about 55 more minutes in the cage, and about two and a half more years as a pro here. She's also got six more fights at the UFC level and about 50 minutes in the UFC cage more than Alexa Grasso. 40% finish rate for Joanne Wood and a 31% finish rate for Alexa Grasso. Uh, Wood has been finished in four of her seven professional losses by submission. And Alexa Grasso has been finishing one of her three professional losses by submission. That means that five of the combined 10 losses of these ladies have been inside the distance, and they've all been by submission. But the fact that neither one of these ladies gets submissions is a good way to tell it. This fight probably does go the distance, as neither one of these ladies is really knocking people out at this level. Um, and neither one of them is losing inside the distance by knockout only by submission. So that's why that this thing is so juiced for the fight goes to decision here. Um, if we look at the aggregate numbers, really nice here for Wood. She throws a lot of volume. Uh, she lands 6.71, only absorbs 4.55, and she throws a lot more volume here at 13.43 significant strike attempts per minute, while her opponents are less than 10 at 9.56. So 52% striking defense is not good. 50% striking accuracy is very good, though. And three knockdowns in uh, 1,028 significant strikes isn't bad for a bantamweight. Alexa Grasso has never knocked anybody down. She's less accurate, and she throws less volume in – uh, in she throws uh, – Wood's got a better ratio of significant strikes attempted to significant strikes uh, thrown by her opponents here. So – but she lands 4.96 and absorbs 3.61, showing 65% striking defense. So I really do like those numbers out of Grasso. 
She's going to have the one inch reach advantage here. She's a lot more defensively responsible. She's a, um, but it's going to be Wood who's more accurate and who's throwing more. Um, in terms of what's going on on the ground for these ladies, we see Grosso's fights are taking place in control time positions about 31% of the time. And for Wood, it's about 41% of the time. Uh, Wood is the much more willing grappler here. She gets 1.57 takedowns for 15 minutes, and Grosso only gets 0.28. And Grosso hasn't done a good job of stuffing, stuffing the takedowns either at 60% uh, here. 15 of 38 her opponents have been successful on takedowns. But even though Grosso has only attempted five takedowns and her opponents have attempted 38, She's out controlling her opponents 18.87% to 12.48. So it's really hard to win minutes on the ground against Alexa Grasso. She's got a fantastic get up game, you guys. 107 minutes in the cage. That would be about 13 or 14 minutes of control time on 15 takedowns. So less than a minute of control time per takedown and less than 30 seconds of control time per takedown attempt. So Grasso, even though you can take her down, she does get back up. Wood has spent about 30 minutes of her UFC career being controlled on 11 takedown attempts. So if Grasso does get takedowns, it, it is Wood who's the easier one to hold down here. Um, when we look at the uh, strength of schedule numbers for these two ladies, um, it's very close. Uh, 1.28 ratio for Grasso, 1.24 for Wood, and almost the identical amount of total fights. The, wood, the win's just a little bit better here for Grasso. And the losses of uh, coming to a little more experienced competition for Wood, but the better win-loss uh, ratio for Grasso here. So it's really close kind of everywhere. Um, I think Wood can win minutes on the feet here with her volume, um, with her accuracy. Um, and she'd probably be the more likely one to go for takedowns and to try to win minutes on the ground as well. Um, but Grasso is much younger. Um, she's looked fantastic in her last two fights against Barber and Kim here. And, uh, you know, when we saw the loss to Esparza, it's kind of hard to picture Grasso right now losing to, to fighters that aren't going to wrestle her. Her last two losses are to Suarez and Esparza. But K Kovalkiewicz, Kim and Barber, you know, uh, she handled them quite well. So um, I really do think that we can see Alexa, Alexa Grasso get this win, get it by decision. Is there any value in the decision prop for Alexa Grasso right here, you guys? Let's have a look-see. Grasso by decision. Ugh. Of course, it's for just below. Grasso by decision, yeah, minus 115 is the best we can get. I can't endorse that. That's just not. I mean, I think it's a fairly close to 50-50 fight here, so I think the value is on Joanne Wood as the underdog here at plus 200. I think this line is too wide, but, you know, I still do think Grasso wins the fight. I'll be staying away from this one, though. Uh, main event. Got a big bet on this one, you guys. Uh, we got Chris Dawkins squaring off against Curtis Blades. Striker versus grappler matchup here. It's going to be Dawkins, who's a year younger, I mean, a year older, uh, blades an inch of height and a four inch reach advantage. So we like the tail of the tape for blades here. We also like the experience for blades as he has three more pro fights, about a hundred more minutes in the cage as a pro nine more UFC fights and about 130 more minutes in the UFC cage, 67% finish rate for uh, blades in his 15 wins, all of them by knockout. So 10 of 15 wins coming inside the distance by knockout for blades. And he's been finished in all three of his losses twice by Ngano, once by Derek Lewis, all by KO. That's kind of how you lose to those guys. Dawkus has finished 92% of his 12 wins inside the distance by knockout. That's 11 of 12. And he's been finishing all four of his pro losses. So we got Dawkus and Blades combining for seven pro losses. All seven have been inside the distance. In addition to that, it's a heavyweight fight, and heavyweight fights finish around 67% of the time. And in addition to that, this is a five-round fight, and Chris Dawkins has never been out of a third round. So fight doesn't go to decision is about as easy of a bet to recommend as anything. This is a parlay piece. It is a safe bet. It should be minus 500 or minus 600. 
because minus 500 would, would say 83% implied probability of it finishing inside the distance. And that's with, you know, 100% of these guys, seven combined losses coming inside the distance. And this is a five round fight. And then uh, 11 of 12 for Dawkins and 10 of 15. So it's 21 of 27 wins coming inside the distance for these guys. Um, but what's an even better bet, you guys, is the fight ends by KO. Because Chris Dawkins has never won by submission. Curtis Blades has never won by submission. And in these guys' seven combined career losses, only one of them has come by submission. And it was four or five years ago against Dawkins. So fight doesn't go to decision sitting at minus 280 here on DraftKings. That's the best that we can get it. But fight ends by KO. Minus 180 on a fan duel that is half price for where the fight goes to this or doesn't go to decision is and neither one of these guys has ever won by submission and only one of seven career losses has ever come by submission so that's a great way to play the fight doesn't go by getting it by its most likely condition which is for it to end by knockout so blades size advantage blades experience advantage Dawkus, the finishing advantage. The striking uh, goes to Dawkus here. As we see Dawkus landing 7.71 significant strikes a minute, absorbing less than half that at 3.5. We got a 53% striking accuracy. Chris is landing knockdowns at a 4.55% rate to the total significant strikes that he lands. And he's averaging 5.26 knockdowns per 15 minutes. Blades lands 3.44 and absorbs 1.65. So he's landing twice as many significant strikes as his opponents as well. Um, he's just a little less accurate and a lot less powerful on the feet than Chris Dawkins, but he's showing just under a 60% striking defense. Both these guys have been knocked down. Dawkins once in 60 significant strikes absorbed, and Curtis Blades three times in 245 significant strikes absorbed. While this fight is on the feet, I'm going to say that Dawkins will be the better striker. But obviously, Curtis Blades is the best wrestler in the heavyweight division right now. He has 115 takedown attempts. And despite the fact that he's shot that many takedowns, he's still getting them at over a 50% clip. Uh, he's averaging 6.27 takedowns for 15 minutes and out-controlling his opponents at a 27-to-1 ratio, 54%. To 2%. He's been taken down four times and he's been controlled 2% of his UFC career. Dawkins has never attempted a takedown in the UFC and he's never been taken down in the UFC, showing 100% takedown defense. His fights have stand, stayed standing 85% of the time. So <clears throat> we got a guy who spends 55% of his time in control time positions in Blades and a guy who spends 15% of his time in control time positions in Dawkins. So Blades is going to wrestle. He's going to try to get Dawkins down to the ground, win the fight via ground upon. Dawkins is going to try to stop Blades' takedowns, keep the fight on the feet, find that chin like Ngano did twice, like Derek Lewis did, and knock him out. Um, you look at the strength of schedule here. We're going to see that the, the ratios are almost identical, and the total fight's just a little bit better for Blades here. Uh, the win's a little bit better here as he's facing the more experienced competition as Blades, but we still see that 2.11 ratio here for Dawkins' wins. Um, and the losses, uh, both of these guys are losing only to studs. You know, we see the names on Blades' resume here are Rosenstreich, Derek Lewis, Volkov, Dos Santos, Shamil. And we've got Dawkins, Derek Lewis, Shamil, Olinick, Nascimento, and Porter. So it's, it's Blades who's fighting the better competition, beating the better competition, losing to the better competition here. It, it just comes down to whether Chris Dawkins can stop these takedowns. Because if he can stop these takedowns, he's probably going to find Blades' chin at some point. And when he does, Blades is going out. He's been knocked out before. He's been knocked down um, on 1.2% of the significant strikes that he's absorbed. So, you know, three knockdowns in those fights that he's absorbed. So, um I think that Dawkins, if you see the four wins, they're all inside the distance. They're all by knockout. Three of them came in the first round. One of them came in the second round. But that Abdul Rahimov knockout, he could have finished them in the first round. It was just Smith didn't stop the fight. So 
I think that if you're on the blade side, you can hedge with first round knockout by Chris Dawkins at like plus 1200 and then bet the blades money line sitting at minus 300 minus 350 here. But I have a 3.6 unit bet, you guys, on the fight ends by KO at minus 180. I'm trying to win two units there. I believe that if this fight finishes inside the distance, like a 90% chance that it's going to be by knockout. I'm, I might hedge with Dawkins by submission at plus 1300, just in case he gets a submission. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, but most likely this fight ends by KO. Um, I'm going to pick Curtis Blades to do it. Uh, I don't know if, if Dawkins can stop the wrestling. We've only seen him stop two takedowns in the UFC, but this wrestling that we're going to see from Curtis Blades is on another level. And it's just like how Carol Rosa hasn't really seen the kind of wrestling she's going to see from uh, Sarah McMahon. It's the same situation here. Um, Got to pick Curtis Blades to get this done. Second or third round ground and pound knockout. But uh, I think Chris Dawk is to win by first round knockout if he stuffs a couple of takedowns and lands a big shot. is absolutely live. Wouldn't hate sprinkling that. Love the fight doesn't go to decision at minus 280. Love the fight ends by KO. And I love Blades by knockout as well because that's his most likely career uh, path to win this fight. Um, the pick, Curtis Blades, inside the distance, you guys, by knockout. An hour and 45 minutes it took to break down 13 fights on this fantastic UFC Columbus card. Thank each and every one of you guys for hanging out in here. I see that we've got my guy addicted to combat with a generous domination saying stacking cash tickets like flapjacks, baby. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to do. Take money from the bookies instead of the other way around. And what's the best way to take money from the bookies, you guys? It's with Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week. And that's the last order of business that we have on the plate today, you guys. I'll get the ticker rolling across the bottom. Who's it going to be for Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week this week? There are so many options. There are so many juiced lines. And you guys were probably asking me, Wheezy, what's the max bet? We didn't hear about a max bet yet. Well, there was a max bet. And the max bet is going to be Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week. Earlier in the week, I made a five-unit bet, my first max bet of the year. And it will come on one man by the name of Aliashkab Kisraev. Minus 325, five units to win 1.5. I love Kisraev's power. This guy finishes so many fights in the first round. He throws heavy body kicks, heavy head kicks, heavy leg kicks. When he comes forward, he looks to take your head off. If he doesn't take your head off, he uses his striking to enter on his takedowns. Once he gets his takedowns, he's looking to finish you with ground and pound. If you survive getting finished by ground and pound, he's just going to positionally dominate you for the full three rounds and torture you for the full 15 minutes. Dennis Tialulin, you have got your fucking work cut out for you on Saturday. Big ups to you for having the balls to take this fight against this absolute killer, but I am not getting in Eliash Cobb's Kizrayev's way, you guys. Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week is Eliash Cobb Kizrayev to shave the ass of Dennis Tialulin. Max bet at minus 325 of five units. I apologize that the line has moved to minus 600, you guys. I know that that doesn't help you out, but this was my decision to do this earlier in the week. And I think Kizrayev is an absolute sure thing. Um, that's going to be Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week this week. I try to give you better lines, but this is one that I'm so confident in. And since I max bet it, I had to make this one Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week. You guys, we did it. We broke down all 13 fights. We've got my guy, Aliyah Kab Kizrayev, as the pick to shave ass this weekend. I'd like to thank each and every one of you guys who have hung out for the last two hours on my channel on Tuesday nights. I'd like to thank everybody that donated to the channel, um, in particular, Gogo Flamingo and Taji Fei with just incredibly, incredibly generous donations. But everybody else addicted to combat and the MG. Uh, I, I know I'm forgetting one other person uh, who, who contributed. Thank you all so much. Job bless each and every one of you guys for hanging out on a Tuesday night with your Uncle Wheezy for just the tip. 
I'll be back tomorrow on uh, Pub Sports Radio at 6 p.m. Central Time for the DFS show with DFS by the numbers, Luke from Sparring with Reality Betting, and Monk Maddox. And I will also be back tomorrow on my channel, 10 o'clock Central Time. I'm going to try a new show idea out. I didn't want to do another Balls Deep breakdown this week, but I've got all this stuff on my computer. I've got a prop template. I've got a database that's sorted by weight class. And I wanted to do a show called Ask Wheezy, where I'm just going to come online here at 10 o'clock Central Time tomorrow night. And, and if you guys have any questions that you want to ask, like something you could say, hey, how does Curtis Blades wrestling stack up with the rest of the heavyweight division? I can bring up my database. I can sort it by takedowns. We can see, I can sort it by control time. And we can kind of just see how some of these top wrestlers, how some of these top strikers match up against other people in the division. Any questions that you guys might have where you say, you know, I'd like to get really deep into the stats here. Like we looked at Sarah McMahon and six wins and six losses and you know, the um, differences with how she performs when she wins and how she loses. Since I have access to all this data, and since it's all readily available on my computer, I figured I'd just come on, shoot the shit with you guys. And if you have any questions for me, any, you know, uh, data questions, numbers, questions, anything, you just ask me and I'll answer the question and we'll just talk fights. But that's what's coming up tomorrow night, 10 o'clock. And then we're going to have a week off. So, hey, thank you guys for hanging out on a Tuesday night. Thank you for all the donations. Hit that thumbs up on your way out. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do that. And then please do one more thing for me this weekend on Saturday, you guys. And that's stack cashed tickets like flapjacks for UFC Columbus this Saturday, you guys. Let's make a ton of money. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. And thank you for all the support. I love each and every one of you guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night.